The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, two authors take us inside the modern-day movement for democracy in America and find hope. Plus, author David Marinus joins Bill Press to talk about his own family's history with the Red Scare. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. In his newest book, co-authored with Francis Moore LePay, organizer and scholar Adam Eichen goes to the roots of the anti-democracy movement in America and answers the question, what do we do now? And we say hello to Adam Eichen, campaigns manager at Equal Citizens and co-author with Francis Moore LePay of Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning and Connection for the America We Want. Adam Eichen, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thanks for having me again. Great to be here. Our pleasure to have you with us. At this point, there is a certain level of cynicism about democracy, I think it's fair to say. There's a sense that even if we follow the rules, it's not really working. And some would say it's never really worked. What keeps you convinced it is worth fighting for? Well, I, I think above, above all, we have no choice. Democracy is the only form of government, in my mind, that ensures that the people have a say over our, our collective future. But, you know, I agree that our democracy has never truly work, that we have never had a fully functioning democracy. Our nation's history proves that. Uh, It's always been a question of who can vote when and who has political power. But I will say that, that we've passed policies over the years that have shown we can push the ball incredibly far in terms of getting to that point of a representative democracy. I think the the Voting Rights Act of 1965, how bad our apartheid system was before then in terms of voting and civil rights. And that bill passes becomes law and changes our democracy. Of course, the Supreme Court gutted it in 2013, but that was remarkable progress. And if we can pass bold reform, like the Voting Rights Act, across all areas of our democracy, then I truly believe we can get closer to that uh, more perfect union. Mm -hmm. Learning by history. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, In writing about the anti-democracy movement in the United States, you focus on a moment in 1971 and the Lewis Powell memo. Remind us of what that was and why it was so influential. Right. And And I should say that, you know, the reason we're in the place we are with our broken democracy is largely because there was this concerted effort by what my co-author and I call the anti-democracy movement. And we, we trace its origins to this Powell memo. And Lewis Powell was a soon-to-be Supreme Court justice. He would write many influential decisions, including some that deregulated campaign finance reform or deregulated campaign finance. Uh, and he wrote this memo to the business community, to the Chamber of Commerce, that basically said, you know, corporations and business folk need to start getting involved in politics. And he outlined a bunch of ways that he wanted, uh, you know, the, the American capitalists to go in and influence policy and to change the minds uh, of ordinary Americans to save the free enterprise system, as he would say. Um, and so he said, you know, we need people in D.C. We need lobbyists. We need think tanks. We need to monitor textbooks. We need to watch the media to make sure the business point of view uh, is, is heard. And, and that, you know, that was the playbook for how to reclaim, uh, in their minds, the American political institutions for their benefit. Over time, how did we see the thinking of Lewis Powell solidify in American politics? Well, I think if you track, you know, from 1971 on, the changes in how the ultra-wealthy and corporations interacted in our political system, you'll see how influential the the memo was. You see the number of lobbyists 
uh, increasing rapidly, I think 14-fold in the 10 years after the Powell memo, starting in 1971, 1972. You see, you know, campaign uh, spending go up. You see, uh, you see many different types of organizations, think tanks, uh, starting to, you know, pump out studies to that can then go into the hands of politicians. You see, uh, you know, schools and, and new ways, new foundations being funded uh, or, or spending money in different ways. Um, if you follow that money, you'll see that this really was, this playbook was enacted to a T. And starting in the kind of early 2000s into the 2010s, you see it morphed into a different kind of strategy that also involved rigging of the rules themselves. Um, so you see the proliferation of voter ID laws, deregulation of campaign financing, uh, pushing policies through organizations like the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, which really solidify uh, the power that they've um, that they gained. So it's really a manipulating of the mind in terms of changing the narrative through which we see the world through think tanks and schooling, and then also rigging the rules so that once in power, it's much harder to have a democracy that's actually representative. Mm-hmm. You know, I. I I'm, I'm sitting here thinking and, and, you know, specifically about today, we could spend hours talking about the challenges to democracy. But what concerns you the most? I mean, honestly, I don't think there's one thing in particular that concerns you the most. It's everything about the uh, kind of the ways in which our democracy isn't uh, isn't representative. And that's not to be pessimistic. It's just to say that we have to recognize the problem for what it is. And that's a democracy that on many, many, many different levels does not work. There is no single solution that there's voter suppression that's proliferating across the country. The Electoral College just does not represent Americans equally. Money in politics is flooding our elections. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. You have gerrymandering that's, you know, in the 2010s was the worst it's ever been. Uh, you know, so in all these different ways, our democracy is severely broken. But to understand how we get out of this mess, we have to understand just how broad the attack on our institutions has been. And to me, that actually gives me hope. In other words, if we can identify the problem, we can work towards fixing it. Right. And again, this is an opportunity for us to learn from history, right? I mean, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's right there in front of us in black and white if we choose to look at it. Uh, right. We're speaking with Adam Eichen, campaigns manager at Equal Citizens, co-author with Francis Moore LePay of Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning and Connection for the America We Want. Adam, moving to the movement to restore democracy, you point to another moment and this one in April of 2016 and a protest called Democracy Spring. What was important about that event? Well, for me, that's kind of the, the moment that, that this democracy movement that my co-author Francis Moore LePay and I uh, write about really came into, into its own. It was this mobilization of over 100 different organizations, uh, a march, about 150 people went 140 miles from Philadelphia to D.C. over 10 days, and then about 12, over 1,200 people were then arrested on the Capitol steps uh, demanding uh, getting money, big money out of politics and ensuring the right to vote for all. So it was this moment where these process issues of, of democracy became really palpable for the American public in some respects. It was this moment that the, there was a grassroots visible movement that, that started to emerge, or at least you know, the, the seeds of, it, uh, of which could be seen. Um, and, and ever since then, you see this proliferation of what my co-author and I call the democracy movement that there really is this grassroots movement that is, is notching wins. Uh, you know, you see this in the ballot initiatives across the country in 2016 and 2018. Uh, you know, a, a large number of democracy um, uh, ballot initiatives pass, and you see legislation pass. And, 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 you know, it was really this moment in 2016 where Frankie and I realized, wow, there is something that's not really being reported on that's happening in front of our eyes. Um, so it's actually what really inspired us to write uh, our book together. Uh, was because we wanted to say, hey, there's this movement out there and someone needs to tell its story because it, it provides hope to those who are profoundly depressed about the state of our democracy. What kind of reforms are we talking about, Adam, as far as this democracy movement and, and what they're fighting for? Well, I think, you know, with, on campaign finance, for example, uh, public financing of elections, you know, you look at Seattle where they passed a reform in 2015 where every voter is given four $25 vouchers that they can give to eligible politicians to fund their campaigns. I mean, a radical uh, democratization of political financing, or you think of Oregon and the 15 states that have followed that pass automatic voter registration, that when you interact with an eligible governmental agency, uh, you're automatically registered to vote, or allowing folks to um, register to vote on the day of the election, 
Uh, you think of the you know, independent redistricting commissions to get rid of gerrymandering. So instead of allowing politicians to draw the lines, you allow people who are independent of the political process to draw those lines. Uh, you know, there are so many different types of reform that we not only have you know, in, in you know, white papers, you know, things that think tanks have produced, but have actually been enacted and shown to work. And to me, that gives me more hope than anything, because we know how to fix this crisis. We know exactly what we need to pass to create a more equal representative democracy. It's not rocket science. You know, in one of the chapters of the book, it's titled Bringing Down the Thought Barriers. What are some of the ideas that get in the way of democracy? Well, I think the main one, and it's been a long concerted effort by the think tank, the aforementioned think tanks, is, is to really denigrate government and to, and to think, you know, or to, to suggest that anything public is bad. Um, and, and democracy, to me, is the quintessential public good. It's the idea that we together can come together, you know, can, can create something together, that we, we together can create our own future. Um, and, and to me, that's the essence of a public good. And so the more we tear down government as inefficient, that people are, that only the market itself can be you know, efficient and we should trust everything, turn everything over to the market. Um, you know, that's incompatible with democracy. And so the more we think that way, the more democracy becomes a pipe dream that we think, well, why don't we just allow the politicians to handle it? Or why don't we just allow the market to handle it? But instead of thinking we ourselves have the power to shape our own future. Um, and, and that's a really big thought barrier um, that, you know, has, has really stood in the way of a robust public sphere. Yeah. G- get your brain up off the couch and just <laughs> start making it work a little bit. Right. Um, there's, this is also a book of, it's about strategies. So what are you seeing in the democracy movement that's working? Well, you know, as I said, ballot initiatives. I mean, the, the way to bypass politicians sometimes is the best way to do it. But you see overwhelmingly when something is put on the ballot, uh, like in Michigan, for example, in 2018, a, a grassroots movement of folks uh, started by a 25 or 26-year-old amazing organizer named Katie Fahey put on the ballot an end to gerrymandering, mandating the use of an independent redistricting commission. And it passed overwhelmingly. You see it's in Florida where they restored the right to vote for those formerly incarcerated felons uh, you know, that enfranchised up to 1.4 million people. Uh, of course, the legislature then uh, tried to gut the law or did gut the law. But overwhelmingly, you see ballot initiatives used as a, as a means to uh, have the people vote on their own democracy. And it's been tremendously uh, successful, and it's cut across the partisan divide, which is, is quite remarkable. Um, but, but you also see other things like legislative advocacy. You see, you know, more frequently the use of civil disobedience, which is an incredibly useful tactic uh, to, to force politicians who are unreceptive to the message of people power to take seriously your demands. Um, I think of the group March on Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, which has been doing a lot of that, you know, lobbying and civil disobedience and really pushing like heck uh, to get the reforms that they that they so desperately need there. Yeah. And that was a great show indeed. Um, lastly, this book is an intergenerational effort for you and your co-author. How did that influence the project? Right. Well, well, Frankie and I are 49 years apart in age. Uh, so there's definitely an age gap. But what, what that age gap allowed us to see is that across generations, our belief in democracy uh, you know, was there, that, that we both had this belief that if we reinvigorated the public good, that we could collectively create a better future. And, and moreover, it provided grounding for me, right? I, I grew up, my earliest political memories are, are the Iraq War. Uh, you know, I've always had the threat of climate change on my mind, climate catastrophe, rather, climate crisis. Uh, and, and this belief that I've never really seen a functioning government, right? And, and so, you know, having someone who was, was older than I am be able to provide me with memories and stories about a time when, yeah, democracy has never been perfect. But you know, during the 60s and 70s, there was this real push where, where popular demands of formerly disenfranchised groups, formerly marginalized communities began taking claiming of government something, whether it's the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement. That these, these, this, these are moments where people made demands of government, and government, at least in part, was responding. The fact that she could remind me of those moments of when a democracy was functioning at least better than it is now provided me with enough hope to see kind of maybe there is a way for us to get out of this and then to spread that message far and wide. 
Well, we love the work that you're doing. Adam Eichen, Campaigns Manager at Equal Citizens, co-author with Francis Moore LePay of Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want. Adam, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. I can't wait. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, turning anger into activism and electoral action. Dana R. Fisher on the new American resistance. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. We might expect that corporate billionaires and Coke-funded Republican right-wingers would be howl-at-the-moon opponents of a wealth tax, Medicare for All, and other big progressive ideas to help improve the circumstances of America's workaday majority. But Democrats? Unfortunately, yes. Not grassroots Dems, but a gaggle of don't-rock-the-corporate-boat Frady Cat Democrats. These naysayers are the party's old line Pauls, lobbyists, and other insider elites who are now screeching that Democratic candidates must back off those big proposals. Why? Because, they squawk, being so bold, so progressive, so, well, so democratic, will scare voters. As one meekly put it, when you say Medicare for all, it's a risk. It makes people afraid. Excuse me, but in my speeches and writings, I say Medicare for all a lot. And far from cowering, people stand up and cheer. In fact, the New York Times has just reported that 81% of Democrats and two-thirds of independents support Medicare for All. Even apple pie doesn't score that high. It's simply a lie that the people are afraid of the idea of everyone getting public finance health care. So who really fears it? Three special interest groups, insurance company profiteers, big pharma price gougers, and the political insiders who are hooked on funding from these corporations. This is Jim Hightower saying, not only is it a pusillanimous fabrication to claim that the people oppose any changes stronger than corporate minimalism, it's also political folly. If the Democratic Party won't stand up for the transformative structural changes that America's middle- and low-income majority clearly wants and needs, why would those people stand up for Democrats? As the 2016 presidential election taught us, a whole lot of the working-class Democrats the party counts on won't. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. 
Dana R. Fisher is one of the leading scholars of protest movements. Her newest book tells the story of how a grassroots movement has grown into a full-fledged resistance in the era of Donald Trump. And we say hello to Dana R. Fisher, professor of sociology and the director of the Program for Society and the Environment at the University of Maryland. Her books include Activism, Inc., How the Outsourcing of Grassroots Campaigns is Strangling Progressive Politics in America, and most recently, American Resistance, From the Women's March to the Blue Wave. Dana Fisher, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me, Jim. Well, our pleasure to have you with us. This book documents what is our modern-day resistance. How do you define resistance within the context of your current research? So that's a great question. And so, and I think it's really important to actually start by talking about how I define resistance because the term has been bandied about quite a bit in, um, in recent years, you know, since, since the Women's March happened. So the way that I define it in the book, and I say it actually in the first chapter, is that the resistance includes pe- people working individually and through organizations to challenge the Trump agenda. It includes individual citizens who work as lawyers, artists, scientists, even professional athletes. It also includes organizations that run the gamut in terms of their levels of professionalization. So it includes the ACLU, Greenpeace, professional associations, like I'm a member of the American Sociological Association, uh, and Indivisible are all playing parts in the resistance. It also includes actors within the government that are working with at multiple scales, you know, the town, city, state, federal levels, to resist the Trump administration's agenda and its policies. However, um, I actually think it's really important, and I stress this in the book, that people who are working within the Trump administration to perhaps resist Donald Trump's agenda, but not his politics, do not count as part of the resistance the way I define it. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing that I do is I, I point out specifically that the Antifa, which decided, which got very active in response to white supremacist rallying um, and basically made statements about how they were coming out against fascism and white supremacy. I don't consider them part of the resistance unless they're also challenging the Trump administration, its policy. So that's the kind of consistent thread of the resistance, in my opinion. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Now, this book starts with the Women's March in 2017. And I think a lot of us mm-hmm. were kind of stunned by the numbers, but you saw more than that. What was it about this march that made it such a harbinger of things to come and and different, perhaps, than marches you've studied before? Yeah, well, so uh, the Women's March was remarkable. I mean, in fact, it's been noted to be the largest day of protest in America's history. So it was remarkable, and it was remarkable not just because of all of the people who descended um, on Washington, D.C., which is where I did my research and right by where I live, but because people marched all over the country, and actually they marched all around the world. So there were these amazing images of people uh, participating in the Women's March in other other countries as well. Um, In some ways, I think that one of the, the unique characteristics of the Women's March is that it started out on social media. And it started out by a bunch of, I think, entirely women, actually, who were calling simultaneously for a march to happen after the election of Donald Trump. And what's remarkable about that is these women then decided to join forces. And that's how the, if you want to call it a coalition of leadership for the Women's March began. And Historically, actually, if we look back to other movements and other times in America's history, women have never been the leading force in movements. In fact, there's been a lot of work done that talks about how men really led the civil rights movement. Women, actually, there have been some accounts of how women were treated quite poorly in the the civil rights movement. More recently, there have been accounts about how there was more gender equity among people who participated. At the Women's March in 2017, and actually at every single protest event where I have collected data since the Women's March started this all and was what I call the spark that ignited the resistance, women have made up the majority of participants at all of these protest events. And they were out overwhelmingly at the Women's March. In fact, the Women's March was uh, 85% female in Washington, D.C. 
mean, one of the other things that was really interesting about the women's march is that it mobilized a bunch of people who were politically active and they were engaged already. And, you know, 94 percent of them reported voting in the 2016 election. So in contrast to claims by Donald Trump that the people who were out marching that day were just pissed off and should have voted in the first place, they did actually vote. But I also can tell you, I also asked them that question. They just did not vote for for Donald Trump. They voted for Hillary Clinton mostly. Um, So these were people who were engaged, but about a third of them reported never participating in a protest or demonstration before. So this was very much this, you know, I like to think of it as this act of public uh, therapy in a lot of ways for people who were outraged by the election, about the campaign. And it was really this collective sense of, you know, identity that people felt they weren't alone, but it also was a place where people could share across many different progressive issues that people had felt had come under attack, not just women's issues. Um, And so I think that that's really an interesting point to note here that I actually asked with my colleagues when we survey in the crowds, we asked at the Women's March and then all the other protests, what motivated people to participate? And while women's issues or women's rights was one of the top motivations, 61% of the people in the crowd uh, on that cold January day in 2017 said women's rights was the reason they were out there. People talked about a whole bunch of other issues as being motivations for their participating in the streets and at the Women's March. And that's one of the hallmarks of the resistance is that it spans across progressive issues. It spans across immigration rights, LGBTQ issues, uh, police brutality, racial justice, reproductive rights, gun control. You know, and then there's at all of these events, we have a group of people who always say that they're motivated just by Donald Trump and they felt like they had to get in the streets because of the outrage they felt. You know, another thing I, I would mention, even the unions, and all of a sudden after that women's march, you start to see, and many of these led by women, uh, teachers in different jurisdictions that have stood up and said, and it's not just about the money, it's, a, it's, 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 it's much more than that. It's, it's, you know, we need better education, we need teachers to be taken care of better, all that kind of thing. I think it really, it, it, it really fired up a lot more people, and I think it starts with that, with that march in January of seventeen. Definitely. I mean, and the other thing that I think that I talk quite a bit about in the book is the fact that in contrast to historic uh, movements and like particularly like the civil rights movement, which is tends to be considered kind of the, the, you know, one of the crown jewels of the movements in U.S. history. In contrast to that, where a march on Washington was seen as the goal, you know, we are going to work and organize and do all of these different activities in our communities. And then we're going to march on Washington. We're going to take buses and we're going to work together to get there. In this case, and we've seen this across all of these different marches, the marching on Washington or the large scale protest event has become the beginning of activism. And that's what, why I think it's so notable that a third of the people in the streets at the Women's March had never protested before. Because I've, I've heard many accounts from both organizations and individuals who talk about how they got on the bus to go back after the Women's March, and that's when they founded a, an indivisible group for their local community. That's when they started to coordinate some sort of local democratic association to do work in their communities or a huddle because they wanted to do more and they wanted to do it in their communities after marching. Or even decided to run for office in some cases. Oh, uh, for sure. I don't I haven't heard anybody who said that it was on a bus back from the Women's March that they decided to run for office. But there's no doubt that many people started thinking about running for office right around then. And we can see what they did. And, and many women, many people of color, many young people, many scientists have all run for office. And in, in a lot of cases, they've won. Yeah, absolutely. Now, following the march, Dana, you embarked on a remarkable research project. Tell us a bit about it. And you know, who, you, who did you talk with and what did you ask? Well, you know, the funny thing about this, Jim, is this was not supposed to be a research project. It was just supposed to be a one off at this big march that was called in January of 2017, because I, I historically one of the things that I do in my research, one of my methods is I survey protesters. But then, you know, there was a the travel ban and people were going to airports and then a number of other large marches were called right after that. And I felt Like I had to keep collecting the data because it was just so important to keep track of what was happening. So because I've surveyed protesters in the past and I use this, what we call a field approximation of of a random sample, which is I go into into the field, into the crowd with a team of researchers, many of whom are my graduate students. 
and we span out throughout the whole area and randomly survey people throughout so that we can get a good sense of who's in the crowd throughout the whole space, however big the space may be. Um, so basically I started going out with teams at all of these events. And in the end, um, I had to bracket it to some degree because there were so many marches being scheduled that I just couldn't, I couldn't collect data at all of them because I didn't have the time. I have, you know, I have kids, I have a family, my students did not want to continue doing this with all of their weekends. So I decided that any event that was over 25,000 people in Washington, D.C., we would go collect data. And we collected data at seven large-scale protest events during the period of time between starting with the Women's March in 2017, the day after the inauguration, through Families Belong Together up until the to, till the midterm elections in 2018. So it would have been any of them that were big enough. Um, and I also did collect data at the Women's March 2019. I talk about that in the conclusion, but it's not the bulk of the data. So a lot of what the book is about is about what I found out from surveying all these people who were participating in protests in Washington, D.C. Um, during these peri- this period of time. At the same time, what I try to do is focus on, as I said, protests as this idea of a beginning of activism. And then I trace the people who participated in the protest to see what they did afterwards. So I talked with a number of these, what we call these so-called resistance groups that were coordinating activities to channel what I think of as the outrage and enthusiasm we see in the streets into communities around the country. So I talked with the leaders of those organizations to find out what they were doing and how they were trying to work with the people who had gotten motivated and mobilized around these, these marches. And then I did two waves of follow-up surveys with the people whom I had surveyed. So that was about 2,000 people. And I did a follow-up survey six months before the midterm elections. I asked them a whole bunch of questions, uh, including asking them what organizations they were working with and what they were doing, and also asking them what they thought were the top issues facing our country and what should be done about them. And then I followed up again two days after the midterm elections to look at how people's opinions changed after the blue wave happened. And so those are all the data that I bring together into uh, the book. I mean, and it includes also, I, I've written it in a really a highly personal way where I, you know, I am a character in the book and I talk about kind of my observations and my experiences participating, collecting the data, getting out in the streets. I went canvassing with my sister on the last weekend, the last weekend right before the midterm elections and talk about that. I brought my students down to, uh, observe the protests that were taking place around the Kavanaugh hearings when there were organizations that were both doing um, confrontational activism within the Senate, but then also they were having peaceful protests outside. So I talk about that. So it's all in there and, you know, theoretically tied up with a with a nice bow. I, I just think it's wonderful. We're talking with Dana Fisher, professor of sociology and the director of the Program for Society and the Environment at the University of Maryland. Her most recent book, American Resistance, mm-hmm. From the Women's March to the Blue Wave. And, and obviously, this moment is unique for many reasons. One of them, the number of people engaging, and you touched on that a few moments ago. But what is also striking is the diversity of people resisting, and we touched a little bit on that. But people from a wide range of experiences and, and concerned about a wide range of issues. Tell us about some of the different people that you met as you wrote the book. Um, yeah, so, so, I mean, I think what's really interesting to note here is that, well, the motivations for participating in the resistance in a lot of ways represent what I think of as kind of intersectionality in terms of motivations. And we see a lot of different motivations overlapping in really interesting patterns across all of the different protest events. When I ask people why they came and what motivated them to come, where we have some specific uh, motivations that take precedence and, and at any event. So, you know, two of the events where I collected data were women's marches and they are the women's rights were, you know, some of the highest and most important issues. But people also were concerned about our political system in terms of voter suppression, gerrymandering. Um, So we see these patterns that play out, many of them identity based around, you know, LGBTQIA identities or around immigration, around racial justice. But what I still think is interesting, while we have this kind of diversity of motivation, I mean, there's consistency and diversity simultaneously, which I think in some ways helps to describe kind of progressive progressives in America today anyway. 
But at the same time, there's a lot of consistency across the demographics. So while, as I mentioned before, we see more women than men out, which is unique to this period of time, we also see that across all of these events, the average age is around, you know, in the low 40s. So we're talking about middle-aged, predominantly white women who are extremely highly educated. So that, um, I guess if we look at the education levels, the Women's March 2017 was the highest. If you look at the percentage of people who held a BA or higher, 87% of them, of the people in the crowd were that highly educated. So what we're seeing is a consistent group of predominantly highly educated white women who are kind of leading and playing a very substantial role in this resistance where they have these overlapping intersectional motivations, which is not to say that there aren't people uh, of color in the streets, but it's just to say that they are not, um, they don't make up the majority by any, by any stretch of the imagination. And one of the things that I've talked with a lot of people about since the book has come out is, you know, moving forward, especially as we march towards the 2020 elections, we need to think about how to engage more people of color in the progressive, you know, resistance or however you want to think about it in terms of helping to get progressives elected. How do we get more young people out and involved? And also, how do you get people who are less educated? It's very possible that marching on weekends is not a good way to get people who perhaps don't have a lot of freedom with regard to their working schedules out and involved. Hmm, that's a very good point. Um, you know, resistance, of course, involves much more than marching. And that's one of the themes in the book. And there has been a clear and concerted effort to connect activism to electoral politics. So what's driving that connection? Is it just Donald Trump? No, no, no. I actually think that that is pretty, um, pretty coordinated through the organizations that are active in the resistance or what we, what I call resistance groups. They actually call themselves that. So I decided to just use their term when I talk about them in the book. So as I mentioned, there's this new period of time that we're living in where protest has become the start of activism rather than the end or the goal. And I think that the organizations that have become very embedded in this movement are working very hard to channel specific types of energy. I mean, there's a lot of energy. There's certainly a lot of outrage. And I do think that that is in large part due to Donald Trump and the politics that he has been pushing, um, as well as the way that he likes to, you know, attack people on Twitter. But because of the ways the organizations are playing this, you know, this this channeling role or hurting either even is that they've been focusing specifically on elections. And so we see this clear march from the streets into the districts to do work in the districts so that many of the groups that historically have focused more on issue based politics are now saying the most important thing that we can do to implement interprogressive you know, issue here, uh, equal rights, you know, gender equity, equity, uh, immigration reform, gun control, climate um, relevant policies, any of those things. The best way to do that is to vote and to get people involved in the election and make sure we're voting for progressive candidates. And so that's what they've done. And I think they've, they've channeled that attention and focus again towards 2020. So I think that the organizations are playing a really big role here. And there hasn't been a lot of work before that tried to talk about how people who march in streets and get active in streets, then work around elections. And one of the things that I was able to do because I collected data from people while they were in the streets and was able to follow up with them and trace them, I was able to see how they did go back into their districts and communities and get involved. And get involved, they did. I mean, one thing that's really interesting is that I was able to look at all the different things they did. And, and you know, as I mentioned, they did it with lots of different groups, but not only did they, did they attend town hall meetings and um, contact their elected officials, but they did electoral canvassing, they did voter, voter registration, they wrote postcards, they did all sorts of voter outreach. Um, and, you know, all of those things contributed to the blue wave, like I talk about in the book. And if they're still mobilized, and so far they seem like they are and they're ready to go, they'll be contributing to whatever happens in 2020. Well, you know, it's, and it's great to think that it's whereas there was a time in our history where it, there was the march and then that was it. And, and now it's it's beginning with the march. And what's you know, what's coming is is all after the march, i.e. the activism mm -hmm. and, and the continuation and oftentimes into the electoral politics. This is also I mean, I happening. Also, you know, it, 
Go ahead. I was just going to say, you, you mentioned Activism Inc., and I do talk about in Activism Inc. the way that organizations have historically, or, or till recently, had really counted on Americans not to get involved and do these kinds of activities, but rather to write checks. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, people in my field have talked about armchair activism for so long, or, you know, even some people talk more recently about blacktivism. And what we're seeing now is people are not willing to just sit on their couches and watch politics go by. They, mm -hmm. you know, they woke up with the election, they, you know, and they got involved and they've been paying very careful attention. Yeah. Well, and, and I was going to say, it, you know, as you pointed out, the, the Women's March started with a, a post somewhere or, it's, you know, and, and we're in a digital environment that certainly mm -hmm. was not part of the picture during the civil rights movement, for example. How does that influence the resistance and has it made it perhaps stronger? Well, it, you know, it's actually interesting, Jim, because what, what I talk about in the book is that I think that it's made it in some ways it's made it stronger. It's made it more resilient and more flexible, but mm -hmm. it also provides some challenges as well. So I talk about the fact, I mean, there's no question that during the civil rights period, we could not have had marches on Washington or, you know, the anti-war movement um, in the 70s. We could not have had the kinds of marches we had without organizations playing a central role in communities, getting people involved and then getting them on buses and coordinating an event in D.C. or even a big event that was happening regionally in the United States. Today, you can do that because we have social media and all of these digital tools. The other thing is that organizations have really um, taken on these digital tools and use it to do what they now call distributed organizing. And distributed organizing is, you know, digitally coordinated or facilitated organizing that no longer involves necessarily face-to-face -face connections at all. And it's really changed the practice of membership and the way that we think about members, because it used to be that to be a member of an organization, you had to go to meetings and maybe write a check or at least write a check. And nowadays, membership in many of these organizations is defined as they're having your email address. Hmm. And what that means is that they can get the word out to a lot more people. But what it also means is that when I survey people in the streets and I say, one of my questions is always, are you a member of an organization that's coordinating the event today? It used to be when I was collecting these data at the beginning, you know, of the, you know, of the century in 2000 and the early aughts, you get around 40% of the people in the streets would say, yes, at the, uh, at the marches where I collected data in the, um, you know, for the resistance, the number is 20% or less. Wow. Yeah. And what? that's not because these people are not necessary. They're not that they're not members. It's the membership has changed. They don't even realize they're members. So if you get an email from Move On or Indivisible or March for Our Lives or any of these other groups, the Women's March, you're considered a member in their book. But that doesn't mean you pay dues. That doesn't mean that you have much what we would consider a brand loyalty to the group. And that, I think, is a uh, is challenging. At the same time, it does mean that you can be contacted more easily and be offered opportunities to do work. And many people are taking, you know, are, are following through with that. So distributed organizing enables also uh, this geographically diffuse movement like we're seeing, much of which is embedded in very blue areas, to channel the energy and enthusiasm into purple areas. We've seen it. We saw it in Virginia. We saw it in Kentucky. We saw it during the midterm elections, and we're certainly going to see it in 2020. But the challenge of distributed organizing is that it means that the people who get involved may not actually be locally embedded. They may not even be connected really at all in any type of relational politics. And, you know, we know historically that when politics are not embedded in community, they don't work as well. So, I think that that's a big challenge that we need to think about. Distributed organizing has been even described to me by some of these groups as, you know, this opportunity for you to get on your phone after the kids go to bed while you're in your pajamas on your sofa and, you know, dial into a purple area to talk people into making sure they've registered to vote and they know how to get to their polling location. That's great. Taking this energy and, you know, and, and focusing it on an area where you need to do this kind of work. But that's not the same as some, some, you know, your neighbor coming over, you know, knocking on the door and saying, hey, do you need me to drive you to the, you know, your polling location tomorrow for, you know, make sure you can get out to vote? Or do you need anything? Or can I watch your kids? Or would you like to borrow some sugar or whatever? Yeah. It is, you know, right. I mean, it's almost a sense of outsourcing. 
which could have oh, a very certainly. negative negative uh, perception there. Oh, definitely. I mean, and I think that right now the groups have been trying very hard to um, figure out how not to let that happen. But I think that's a, a real risk. And bringing in, you know, importing people. We know from the Dean campaign way back when that when you import non-locals to do the job of local communities, it can really, uh, it can backfire. And I certainly hope we don't see that happen. Dana, what's your sense of how this moment could change the future of activism and civic engagement beyond a Trump presidency? Well, now therein lies the rub. I mean, so... There's no question that the election of Donald Trump has been a huge shot in the arm to democracy in America. A lot of people hate to say it, but the fact that the president um, ran on the campaign he ran on and uh, and leads the way he leads, we'll just say it that way, has really motivated people. A lot of it is through outrage, but people have woken up and gotten involved. And, you know, today you'll talk to people who have no involvement whatsoever in politics and they'll know exactly what's going on on the Hill on any given day in ways they never did before. And that is remarkable. Um, I don't think that the people are going to go back to sleep. I think that it would, I I don't know what it would take to get people to go back to sleep. At the same time, our political system has really changed and the degree to which we have, you know, such a reduction in civility in terms of communication and collaboration, that it's just, it's not even feasible to imagine the kind of uh, bipartisan collaboration and communication that we even saw as recently as, you know, 2009. Um, I don't believe that if, if we were to see, you know, a really big blue wave or even a blue tsunami come and hit the United States in 2020, where we have all of a sudden you know, Democratic majority in both houses of the Congress and a Democratic president, I don't see us going back to the more civil period of politics that we saw recently. I think that what comes next is going to involve, you know, everyday Americans paying attention, taking advantage of digital tools that they can to pay attention. I mean, it's a lot easier to keep track of what's going on the Hill now than it used to be. Um, But it also means that leading is going to be different. And I don't know, I don't know what that looks like. It's a really interesting question. Um, But in terms of the resistance, I think we're going to see either, um, you know, an outcome where there is success for a resistance where all of a sudden these many, you know, threads of the progressive movement that when working together as one unified against this common enemy are going to have to reconcile the fact that historically they fight. Mm -hmm. And how they're going to lead and coordinate and, you know, manifest a progressive agenda that enhances democracy in America. That's going to be a a very, very big challenge. If we end up on the other side of this instead with a Republican president, I think that the resistance will will get much more confrontational. I think we will not see people going, "Okay, well, I guess we did our best. We'll go back to sleep now. What we're going to see is people getting, you know, getting more active. And, you know, I don't think we're going to see all of a sudden the United States turning into Hong Kong, but I certainly think that we'll be seeing a lot less peaceful protests and a lot more, you know, challenging tactics that are competition. Yeah, yeah. I, sadly, I think it would be closer to Hong Kong than than we'd ever, ever really want to see. Um, before we let you go, what's the message Democrats yeah. and even more specifically progressive Democrats should be hearing from the resistance? Well, I think, I mean, so my data suggests that, uh, that progressive Democrats are the resistance, um, based on what their priorities are based on where they put themselves ideologically on a spectrum. And I basically, I think the message is they need to keep it up. I think that they, the, the biggest thing they need to recognize is that what they've been doing has been making a difference. And, you know, the only way to have the America that they want to live in is to keep working at it. I mean, you know, democracy was always seen, you know, as a work in progress. And I think that we got a little lazy and progressive Democrats, are, you know, tend to be the lifeblood of the resistance. And they have been doing a lot more than just 
you know, reading the newspaper, or I guess they no longer read newspapers. So, you know, more than just uh, <laughs> keeping track of everything from the sidelines, I think that um, politics is a context for it, and I think they need to, to stay in it. They read newspapers, they just read it on a tablet now. Exactly. So, well, I think, not- yeah, but they, or, they read, or they read podcasts or listen to podcasts, right? Right. Very, well, I hope they're doing that anyway. Dana Fisher, <laughs> professor. Me too. Of, yeah. <laughs> Dana Fisher, professor of sociology and the director of the program for society and the environment at the University of Maryland, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Her most recent book, American Resistance, From the Women's March to the Blue Wave. Dana, thank you very much for your time with us today. Would love to have you back and talk more about it in the near future. Thank you so much, Jim. It was my pleasure. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press interviews celebrated author David Marinus, whose newest book tells the story of his father, who was targeted as a communist at the height of McCarthyism. The book is about my father being called before the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1952, uh, after his name was named by an informant in Detroit, and he was fired from his job as a newspaper man, and we bounced around for five years while he was blacklisted. Uh, My father, by the time I became of a conscious age, had survived that and moved on. I was two when this happened. Um, By age seven, after the five years of blacklisting, my father started teaching me all of the lessons of his life. Don't fall for any rigid ideology. Search for the truth wherever it takes you. Um, And he had survived and moved on and created a wonderful life for himself, my mother as well, and our family. It was not something he talked about. And it was not something I was going to write about while he was alive. Um, I wanted to honor him in that way, but but it was probably a book that was in me all along. And it's, you know, about eight years ago, I started thinking about it deeply and thinking about, you know, I'm doing all these other biographies, you know, exploring the mythology of Barack Obama, you know, in different ways, and Bill Clinton and Vince Lombardi. And it's time for me to really explore my own life. Why, not just my, my parents, but also to learn from that why I am the way I am, which happened with the research for this book. Your dad was a member of the Communist Party. He was. My my parents met at the University of Michigan in the late 19, in the mid 1930s, late 1930s, a period that in many ways was uh, sort of similar to the 1960s in terms of its activism. Um, They were motivated by the idealism of the Great Depression and the challenges of capitalism during that era, by the rise of fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany, and by the ever-present racial injustice of the U.S. Those were the idealistic things that brought them into this. Um, My mother was a member of the Young Communist League at at the University of Michigan. Her older brother um, was also a Michigan uh, student and went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War, one of three Michigan students who who were, joined the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in Spain. My father was the editor, editorial editor of the Michigan Daily um, in the late 1930s and was radicalized during that period. And, um, you know, when I'm going through the editorials that he wrote, um, there's times when I shake my head and said, what were you thinking, Dad? You know? <laughs> I mean, and not about funny things, you know, like his support, his rationalization of the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939, which a lot of young communists found a way to support, even though it was indefensible. Um, and then he was, he, he went off, well, we'll get to that. He, he, yeah. was, he was in World War II and 
And in 52, he was called before the committee because of his past. Right. Uh, you mentioned some of, the, some of the factors that drove some Americans to consider joining yes. the Communist Party. Was it ever, and you also mentioned, so you were growing up in Ann Arbor. This happened in Ann Arbor, right? Michigan is where it started. Detroit yeah. is where he was fired. Okay. Yes. Um, at the Detroit but, Times, he worked. You mentioned that at, at one point there, around that time, there were 1,332 members of the Communist Party in Michigan, which had a population of 6.4 million. So it does raise the question, was the Communist Party... American Communist Party, ever a real serious threat at all? Um, I would say no. I would say that there were certainly some um, members of the Communist Party in the United States who were either agents for the Soviet Union or, or uh, advancing the Soviet arguments. Um, and some were, you know, like Alger Hiss was in the State Department. I mean, there's, and there were other People were spies for the Soviet Union. A very minute number of that already minute number of total uh, members of the Communist Party USA. Um, it was the, the whole basis of the attack on the party was that if you were a member of the Communist Party USA, that meant automatically that you, you uh, supported the violent overthrow of the United States government. Which your father did not. Never. No, I mean, you absolutely not. He loved the United States and was trying to improve it. He was naive about the Soviet Union, to say the least. But, but the vast, vast majority of leftists, communists, socialists of that era, people who were either in the party or sympathetic to it in some way, um, were not in any way espousing the overthrow of the American government. One thing that I found striking was that at the hearing where your father is called in, uh, the chairman is Chairman John Stevens Wood. Yes. Who was a member of the KKK, uh, who was a sponsor of the poll tax in the United States Congress. Um, so who was the un-American? Well, that's your the central... father or the chairman of the committee? Yeah, thank you for asking, because I consider that the central question of the book. Who is American? I mean, it's a question that's as valid today as ever. Um, who decides who's American? Um, John Stevens Wood, yes, was a, a Southern racist. Yes, was uh, briefly a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And also um, was involved in the most notorious lynching in Georgia history, uh, the lynching of Leo Frank, the Jewish industrialist who was accused falsely of of murdering a 13-year-old woman, girl, in his pencil factory. And um, that event was like the, this is a bad analogy, but it's sort of like the OJ trial of its era in that everybody, it was front page news for, for, there was no TV, but the New York Times covered it, the Chicago Tribune, the Anti-Defamation League actually was born because of that case. So much pressure was put on that, that the governor commuted the death sentence of Leo Frank. And the powers that be in Marietta, Georgia, where the girl was from, were so enraged by this and by their own sort of anti-Northern populist, anti-Semitic fervor that they concocted a plot to go up to the prison where Leo Frank was held, seize him from the prison, put him in the back of a car, drive him back to a field near Marietta and lynch him. The mastermind of that plot was Marietta's most powerful figure, a judge named Newt Morris. And Newt Morris's chief disciple was John Stevens Wood, the future chairman of the House Un-American Activities Committee. It was Wood who drove the car that carried the lynched body of Leo Frank. So this person, this congressman, is the one calling my father, who, as we'll see, commanded an all-black unit in World War II, un-American. Right. I, I wanted to get to that because the other thing that struck me was going on at the time, um, was the worst of um, treatment of African Americans in this country since slavery, I guess. But so there was segregation in the military, uh, obviously still segregation in American schools and businesses, restaurants. Uh, that veterans coming home from the war, who had, um, African Americans who had fought in the war, coming home and not being able to enjoy the freedoms uh, of this country. That in the military, 
there, that there were also this, these battles going on between def, among defense workers, white yes. people, work, white um, workers in the defense factories did not want African Americans coming up from the South and working in these defense plants. I mean, that was a reality that the Communist Party, American Communist Party of the USA, was able to exploit. Right, and take they did exploit of. it. Um, my parents were involved on both ends of that. Um, my mother, during the war, worked as a Rosie the Riveter in a defense plant in Detroit, which was where riots broke out in 1943 between black and white workers over housing and everything else that was going on and the tensions of that, that moment and the racism of Detroit. My mother was a stop sh shop steward and was... Uh, taking a trolley through the, the area where uh, part of the violence was going on, and she was untouched. Um, and my family's sort of legend is that it was because of, of her goodness about that issue. But in any case, at the same time, my father was in the military. He enlisted right after uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, he was investigated by military intelligence because of his radical past at Michigan. Um, for a while, he was, as many radicals were, he was put into isolated posts. Some were sent to the Aleutian Islands. He was sent out to West Texas and Oklahoma. And finally, in late 1944, he got his shot, which was he, he had gone through officer candidate school, and he was put in charge of training and leading an all-black unit uh, at Camp Lee, Virginia. Um, and in researching this book, I was able to get 100 letters that my father wrote to my mother uh, as he was in that process. And they're incredibly illuminating about his understanding of the complexity of a situation where he was training young black men who were being asked to fight and perhaps die in the name of democracy and liberty for a country that treated them as second-class citizens. And in his letters, you see him sort of being proud that he's training this group in a way that the the um, the NCOs aren't considered Uncle Toms. They were black, the officers were white. As it turns out in that segregated racist era, um, the officers of these all black units tended to be almost exclusively either Southerners who were considered, would know how to handle blacks because of the dealings of, in the South and the racism in the South. Um, or Northern Radicals, and my father was in the latter group. Um, and he trained and led this, this black company in a way that they thought they were getting a fair shake. Uh, I had never seen before this poem by Langston Hughes, which you quote uh, in the book, just one stanza. Yet you say we're fighting for democracy. Then why don't democracy include me? I ask this question because I want to know how long I got to fight both Hitler and Jim, and Jim Crow. Crow. Yeah. That was the reality of that time. I mean, you know, the greatest generation, the good war, um, all of that can be true. And yet there's this uh, other side to, to the reality of race in America coexisting with that. Bill Press talking with David Marinus, author of A Good American Family, The Red Scare, and My Father, on the Bill Press Pod. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. Well, that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Adam Eichen, Dana R. Fisher, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.